Now, the evidence for there being a supermassive black hole powering the active galactic nuclei, that evidence is building. We have a lot of examples. And here is one M87, an elliptical galaxy, with a star density in the center region that's 300 times more than normal ellipticals. Incredibly dense center region. The center there is magnified, and you can see the active galactic nucleus here in this very fortuitous ability to image this radio jet coming out of the AGN. Now, the gas is orbiting extremely fast around this center, literally 800 kilometers per second, 60 light years from the center. So the way this is done, here is an image of the active galactic nucleus, and you can get measurements of the gas being redshifted and blue shifted as it orbits around extremely rapidly. And so here's a graph of the blue shift, and then here's the red shift, and they are shifted a lot, producing the results for the velocities. And when you sort through all the data, you discover that to produce those velocities, it requires a nucleus with a mass that is 3 billion solar masses. So the central object there in that nucleus is 3 billion solar masses. That's huge, of course. So an active galaxy may actually be a normal galaxy that's just awakened by material to consume and feed this supermassive black hole. That's a ever-increasing assumption by astronomers studying these things. And so it could be stated that it's possible that all galaxies have supermassive black holes, some of which are manifesting themselves as active because of the material to feed the supermassive black hole in the center. So accretion disks and supermassive black holes both seem to be part of the active galactic nuclei recipe. So what about the supermassive black hole accretion disk? Here's a drawing of one in relatively simple form to get the basic idea as to the currently understood mechanism by which it can produce the high energy lobes, the jets, the bipolar outflows. Here the disk is about 15 astronomical units real close to the supermassive black hole itself. Now the real estate, the, the region close to the supermassive black hole is really going to be crowded because the incredible gravitational intensities of the supermassive black hole is going to draw the material in. And orbits closer in are faster than those further out. So the faster moving inner rotating gas is going to interact with the material from outside, heating it up, and gravity bringing it all in. It's spiraling in, becoming compressed like crazy, and heating up to millions of degrees because of this differential rotation. Now associated with the high temperatures is also very high pressure. So as this material of the accretion disk is forced in, heated up through frictional interaction, the pressure soars through the roof. And so the forces become extreme. And as you can see, the material, the material coming in, as it's being pushed together by stuff from outside, it's got to have a place to go. And the material right in line with the black hole is preventing it from coming in. So <clears throat> it needs a, a pressure relief. And that basically, that valve is to come shooting up in a direction perpendicular to the disk itself. And that's exactly what we see. So the pressurized material gets shot up at high velocities in opposite directions from this converging accretion disk. Here is an example of exactly that happening, at least in the minds of many astronomers studying this. NGC 4261, we see a visible light. Here is a visible light 
image and then the radio image showing the radio lobes going out in each direction. Notice there's no visible in the radio itself. It's almost strictly radio emission. <clears throat> so this thing seems to be going through this process. The accretion disk is about 800 light years in extent. It's got a 1.2 billion solar mass, supermassive black hole in the center. And it also reveals that it's got this double lobe structure. Not easily seen in this image, but other images show the double lobe radio sources. The unifying principle that brings together everything we're talking about is that the power source is mass accreting onto supermassive black holes. So that is the agreed upon best explanation for all the phenomena that we've been discussing. And now let's put it together in a basic model. And now a basic overview of the supermassive black hole model for active galactic nuclei. We have this rotating accretion disk spinning at tremendous rates and it's plasma. So that produces huge magnetic fields that are, as it condenses in, these magnetic fields are twisted into a spiral-like configuration above and below the disk. Now some of the material in falling as we discussed, gets compressed, heated up, the pressure rises to huge levels, and some of that material is squirted up through the magnetic fields. Now the magnetic fields rotating and twisting are actually narrowing the channel for the material to be squirted through, and the dense gas also. So the, the jets are narrowed as a result of this dense gas you're blasting through. So you have narrow streams of relativistically moving particles. In other words, they're moving very fast. The magnetic field's twisting them around, producing synchrotron radiation, which is the result of charged particles swirling around, accelerating. They produce radiation that's got unique, a unique profile. It's called synchrotron radiation. And so by observing that type of radiation you know that what's producing it is something like what this model is suggesting. So how are all these various active galactic nuclei then manifesting themselves? Very simply it has to do with the angle by which the observer is observing it. So the active galactic nuclei objects are all fundamentally the same thing, just viewed from different angles. That's the proposed idea. So here we have the jets, we have the accretion disk, Taurus, supermassive black hole in the center, and if you're looking at this at an angle, you're going to see what we call a quasar. If you're looking directly down the snout, so to speak, of this jet, that's the brightest form of quasar, which is the BL lock or the blazar, and they have to do with the rate, the distinction has to do with the rate at which the luminosity changes. And then over here, looking at it almost perpendicular to the plane of the accretion disk, you see a radio galaxy or the double radio source. But again, all the various AGNs are really from the same phenomena, a supermassive black hole in the center. And it can account for all the various features of the active galactic nuclei. Now, there's a lot of details that aren't sorted out here, but that is a synopsis and the best theory that is being proposed and it's being supported by all the measurements. Interestingly, the energies we're talking about, of course, are incomprehensible, but just consider you know, when we have nuclear fusion in the center of a star, we have about a 7% a efficiency corresponding to that effect. 0.07 as a fraction of the mass being converted to energy. Material accreting into a black hole can convert 10 to 40% of its mass directly into energy according to E is equal to mc squared. So, the energies that we are seeing produced by these nuclei of the galaxies can actually be as incomprehensibly huge as they manifest themselves to be 
when you do the calculations considering the efficiency by which matter is being converted into energy. I can't resist showing you an example of a supermassive black hole galaxy, an active galaxy in the Perseus cluster. Very rich cluster. Look at all those galaxies. Do you see a kind of an oddball? Uh, kind of a uh, uh, kind of a scary one perhaps? I bet you do. Well this cluster is about 250 million light years distant and by the way this galaxy probably is the one you chose as being scary but it just happens to be an image where they are catching a, a supernova in action. So there it is. Supernova 2008 FG. But this really scary looking galaxy here, NGC 1275. It's a cannibalizing galaxy. So it's one of those. And it's a huge active galaxy in its own right, gobbling up other galaxies, producing lots of strange emissions. And finally, just a few comments on the size of black holes. How, how big are supermassive black holes? How do they form? Is there a model that will predict the size of a black hole? based on other things. Well, it's sketchy, but it seems to be related to the properties of the spheroidal component, particularly the bulge. So the central black hole mass, that's what this is a graph of, versus the mass of the central bulge. There seems to be a correlation. Now this is in solar masses, so this goes all the way up to 100 million, a billion, 10 billion, uh, solar masses versus the central bulge going up to a trillion, 10 trillion solar masses in the bulge itself. The mass of the supermassive black hole just empirically, just by observation, is about a 1 500th the mass of the bulge itself. That's interesting. Probably something you wouldn't guess. But it seems to be a rule of thumb by our observations. Also seems to be connected to galaxy formation. That's a pretty fair statement. It's fairly broad, isn't it? Not real specific. But they seem to affect each other. They likely formed at the same time, the black hole and the bulge. The connection is seems to be real, but speculative in its detail. Nevertheless, there is this correlation here. Then the question of where and how and when do the protogalactic clouds form that make the galaxies. That really hasn't been addressed. That too remains mysterious. But now let's just finish by watching a short video on active galactic nuclei. Most big galaxies contain big black holes. Not just big, supersized, with millions of times the sun's mass. Some of these black holes are actively devouring gas. This drives particle jets that can spew matter millions of light years into space, and it also makes the holes a source of penetrating, or hard, X-rays. At these energies, the sky glows in every direction, even far away from bright sources. Astronomers have long suspected that active supermassive black holes in galaxies were responsible, but they just couldn't find enough of them to account for the X-ray glow, especially the peak of the energy spectrum. Now, astronomers using NASA's SWIFT satellite confirm that a largely unseen population of black hole-powered galaxies is out there. There are so many that scientists say they might fully account for the cosmic X-ray background. What emission we detect from an active black hole is a function of how we see it, whether we're looking face-on and into one of its jets, or viewing it from the side through the disk of gas and dust that surrounds it. The brightest active black holes, which include quasars and blazars, are those we see face on. But as the viewing angle increases, the surrounding disk absorbs increasing amounts of radiation. Astronomers have always assumed that many active galaxies were oriented edgewise to us. But because the disk of gas smothers most of their X-rays, these sideways black holes just weren't detected. And that's where SWIFT comes in. Since 2004, the satellite's Burst Alert Telescope has been building up the largest, most sensitive X-ray map of the sky. Using these data, astronomers found that the most heavily absorbed galaxies create the energy peak in the cosmic X-ray background. What does it all mean? When the universe was about half its present age, about 7 billion years ago, 
Galaxies crashed together more frequently, and these collisions produced gas-rich galaxies with heavily obscured black holes. The Swift survey shows that galaxy mergers helped activate these black holes by feeding them torrents of fresh gas. The new findings are consistent with the idea that the X-ray background peaked around this time, when our own galaxy was young and before our solar system was born.